expand the industry. Let me see. Oh, great development. If we can't provide you with the skilled workers, then you can't be productive and you got big problems. It's all about uh, human development, and that's what your college is about. So if you look at that, one thing is we want to do a better job of connecting our skilled workers with your jobs and your job openings. So on the back, it tells you how you can post your jobs at Central Piedmont. We want you to do that, and I think the entire community, of course, is focused on that very same thing. Also, you're in the Harris Conference Center. It's the only business conference center uh, in Charlotte. We built it, not for weddings, not for family reunions, <laughs> just business. And so uh, we hope that you get a chance to look around while you're here, that you enjoy your stay, and that you'll consider coming back. Uh, meanwhile, let me introduce uh, Congressman Robert Pittenger. I met him 20 years ago, and I thought at the time, uh, here's a really great uh, real estate guy, a developer guy. The next thing I know, uh, he said, what can I do for the college? And I said, well, come on our foundation. So he served on our foundation for years. And he said, Tony, I've gotten so busy. I've gotten into the Senate and our legislature. And I, uh, he said, I'm getting ready to run for lieutenant governor, I think it was at the time. He said, I'm going to have to rotate off. I said, oh, we can't do that. He said, don't worry. You're going to have a picture on your foundation. So we have his son, Bobby Pitcher. We're very pleased. The whole family has been wonderfully uh, supportive Suzanne and everybody else. So please welcome Congressman Robert Pitcher. You know, Tony Zeiss have been on the board for about 10 years. I can say, if he can't light your fire, your wood's wet. <laughs> he is amazing. You know, we've got 70,000 people who come through the system. What are we, nine campuses? Is that right? Uh, six. Six campuses. Well, six, nine. Uh, but, but, you know, it's just remarkable the impact he's had in this region and critical for Charlotte's economy and economic growth. And we're just indebted to you, all of us are, Tony, for the role that you play uh, uh, for our region. You know, we've come today to understand uh, more about the Formal Care Act. And I can give an honest confession that that wasn't on my list uh, of things that I supported when I ran for Congress. I thought there were issues there. I thought there were concerns related to the relationship uh, between a physician and his patient. I was concerned about the iPad, the, the governing board that would determine the scope and cost of health care. So I was concerned about the revenue issues and the, ta the tax burden. So, uh, you know, right now it's, uh, there's probably 19 or 20 new taxes. So all these were factors for me that, uh, as a result, I, I was the one who supported. But nevertheless, it is the law of the land. We need to respect that and understand that. And uh, it has survived the Supreme Court. It has gone uh, uh, through a presidential election. And it is going to have a, a, an enormous effect on each of our lives, our businesses, healthcare providers. And we would do well to know what it's about. And to that end, we had Mr. Mike Tanner come <coughs> and speak. I, I ask all over different places uh, who is very knowledgeable uh, about this uh, issue and can fully explain it. No, we don't, we're not here to debate today. We'll have a question and answer period a little later on, and we ask you just you know, reserve comments in terms of your opinions uh, because we're really not here to debate. But we are here to answer questions. But we want this to be a, a, a forum where uh, Doug Dickerson with AARP and, and uh, Mike Tanner are in the position to answer the questions that you've got regarding this important legislation that's very, very encompassing. So you'll hear different distinctive positions today, perhaps at least two men. There's some issues that aren't fully answered, that are still out there. There's some issues in the courts. They'll go through that with you. Uh, there's some, you know, clarifications that need to be made in the bill. And as it goes down the road, perhaps there'll be some modifications to it. But nonetheless, uh, it is the law today, and it will transform uh, health care. And we're just uh, glad that these men made the time available, that they would be here and be accessible to us, we can explain. So we appreciate you being here. Uh, Pinger uh, organization here in Charlotte and uh, up in Mooresville, uh, our congressional office is here to serve. And beyond this event, if there's any other way that uh, our staff can uh, serve you. Robert Becker is our district director. He's here now, and uh, uh, we want to be there for you. Uh, we are public servants. That's our job.
and uh, we want to be accessible. We want you to know that. So thanks for being here, and uh, I would like now to uh, bring up uh, <coughs> Mr. Chris Weaver. Chris Weaver, who will lead our uh, discussion today. Chris, as you know, is the uh, head of the Carolina Business Review. They're syndicated in both Carolinas, <laughs> and uh, he has been on the air for 20 years. Bill, he is a stockbroker with Wells Fargo, has his own business, but he has played a tremendous role in serving our region through this television program. Uh, brought on many people to inform us, equip us, and allow the Carolinas to really grow uh, in its economic strength. So Chris, if you would come join us now. Thanks, Robert. Thank you, sir. A lot going on here, and let me kind of go through the ground rules. We have a clock up here. Brad, you know what time it is? What time we have? Okay, so it's about 10 minutes after 8. We've got Michael Tanner coming up. Uh, then we're going to have, uh, uh, we'll have Michael Tanner, we'll have Doug Dickerson, then we're going to do Q&A. And this is important to remember a few things. Um, and, and first of all, let me uh, thank Jamie Bowers, Director of Communications for Congressman Pittenger's office. Jamie, thank you for setting this up and doing uh, If you get up and throw things in the middle of it, I also understand that, so we'll, we'll try to, to deal with that. Uh, I also want to give you a, a little idea uh, of where I'm coming from on all of this. Uh, you will get the idea as, as I go through with this that I'm not a fan of this law. Uh, I mean, that'll, that'll come out, uh, I, I think. But I'm going to try very hard to stick to the, the four corners of the playing field and, and deal with the facts of this. And, uh, now, some of the things I say I think will disappoint some of the opponents of the law, and uh, some of the things I say I know will disappoint some of the supporters of the law. Uh, but I'm going to try and talk to you about the facts of the law and what, what it does, what it doesn't do, uh, what it will cost, what it won't cost, thing, things like that. Uh, but, you know, it, it's very hard to say, well, you're going to have a, a completely unbiased anything. Uh, and I want to get that up front. You know, and not too long ago, I saw we in Washington have two newspapers. And two headlines came out on exactly the same day. And the first headline said, three and a half million Americans have mortgages underwater. And the same, next other paper said, the exactly the same headline said, 97% of Americans' mortgages paid up. <laughs> now, which was correct? Which one was mine? Well, they're both exactly true. It's just how you look at it. So you'll get ideas on what I emphasize and what I don't and things like that. that you know, I'm maybe not a, a fan of this, but I, but I hope that I won't say anything that people will say is inaccurate. And so we'll try to try to stick to that, and if we have disagreements, we will we'll then take them through. Uh, with that, I would like to get into this, because uh, we are moving forward. The, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is going to be implemented over the next few years, and it's going to affect, I think, everyone here. Uh, I really think I really have to thank the, the Congressman for having me down here, because this is going to be a crucial issue for, for folks, and for the Congressman to do it at an event like this, have different points of view and to open it up to you to really understand this. I think it's, a, it's a, something that's not done often enough in one. And, uh, you know, that you have someone courageous enough to sort of go forward in the public like this, I think is a terrific, terrific thing. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, the reason I'm going to be talking so long is this is a big bill. Uh, the original law itself was actually 2,409 pages long, uh, about 477,000 words and change. Uh, and, uh, of course, that was not quite enough all by itself to, to rewrite the American health care system. So uh, we then had the reconciliation package, an additional 153 pages and 34,000 words. So all to all, we're about 2,500 pages, give or take, and a little over 500,000 words uh, of new legislation to, to redo the American health care system. Uh, and, of course, that didn't quite do it. So since the law has passed, there has been 13,000 pages of regulations issued. Uh, for how to implement this law. And there's new regulations coming out every day. Uh, you know, as we get to some of the questions and answers, people are going to ask me questions, and I'm going to say, I just don't know, because the rules haven't been written yet, the regulations have been written, haven't been written. There's uh, something close to a thousand times in the bill where it says the secretary shall determine, uh, or rules shall be issued by this department or that department, and they have not been issued yet. So we're still moving forward on a lot of this, and just not going to have answers for, for everything. But we do know, we, you know we, we do put all this together, and it has somewhat redone the American healthcare system. And so this is now what the American healthcare system looks like. <laughs> now, uh, actually, actually, I, I have to confess, this 
and it's the only time this is a partisan document. This is, this is really partisan. It was put out by the uh, Republican staff of the Joint Economic Committee. So it, this is you know, very partisan, not relentlessly nonpartisan. Uh, we'd love to offend both parties equally. <laughs> so we, uh, we actually decided to do our own look at this, and having studied this ourselves, this is what we think the healthcare system now looks like. Uh, a big improvement. Uh, actually, if you look at these, whoops, these, uh, these beige boxes here, uh, these are some of the at least 99 new agencies, commissions, positions, czars, whatever you want to call it, that will be created as part of the Affordable Care Act to oversee various aspects of the healthcare system moving forward. Now, I say at least 99. We don't actually know how many there are. Uh, in fact, the Government Accounting Office, the GAO, looked into this <laughs> about a year ago and said that they were unable to determine how many were created as a result of the law. Because so many of these new agencies, commissions, positions, and czars actually have the authority to create additional agencies, commissions, positions, and czars. So they know there's at least 99 as of right now, but there may well be new ones uh, that, that come out of all of this. So if you look at all this, and you see there's going to be all these new positions, there's 13,000 pages of regulations, there's 2,500 pages of law, it all gets very confusing. And you know, very few people, I have to confess, very few people in Washington have really sat down and read it all the way through and, and done all, all this. On that. And it's completely understandable. Believe me, if you really want something exciting, Sit down and peruse the 300 pages on the Indian Health Service. I mean, you know, there's something that will keep you up uh, most nights uh, turning the pages. Uh, so I'm going to try and break this down if I can and try and really simplify all this and try and get it down to just the key concepts. And I think you can really boil all this down to five key concepts within the law that will have the most impact on people. So let me see if I can just sort of walk you through these five key concepts. And the first of these, and this is the one that's gotten the most attention, it's the one that's gotten, uh, it went to the Supreme Court, uh, gets a lot of play in the media, uh, it is still interestingly, if you poll people, it's probably the most unpopular aspect of the law, uh, and, and probably one of the least understood as well. This is the, the individual mandate. And that is a requirement under the law that every American, with some exceptions, there's a couple of religious exemptions, there's also some exemptions for people with very low incomes, uh, but with those few exceptions, every American must have health insurance. And that is if you don't receive health insurance through a government program like Medicare or Social Security or, or veterans program, uh, and you don't get health insurance through your job, your employer doesn't give you health insurance, then you must go out and buy health insurance on your own. Uh, and if you fail to do so, you will be penalized. There is a, a, a fine, or as the Supreme Court has now declared, a tax that you will have to pay for failing to get health insurance. And that begins in 2014, so it's not in place yet, it'll begin January 1st of next year. And that fine, or that penalty, or that tax in 2014 will be equal to 1% of your adjusted gross income. In 2015, it is 2%, and in 2016 and thereafter, it is equal to 2.5% of your adjusted gross income uh, for failing to, provide, failing to purchase uh, the health insurance. Now, most people, you know, I, I get into a lot of philosophical debates about this. There's people think, well, this is a bridge on their liberty. There's people talk about the free rider problem. There's people on the other side of it. And there, there's people who uh, have all sorts of philosophical positions on this sort of individual mandate. And that's what makes it so controversial. But most people figure it doesn't really apply them to them. It doesn't affect them in any real way. <clears throat> because they have health insurance. I mean, this, this is a requirement that says you must get health insurance. But if you already have health insurance, then it's probably not going to have any impact on it, right? Well, not quite. Because if the government is going to tell you you have to buy health insurance, then it is going to have to say, what is health insurance? You know, I mean, it's, it's only logical. Uh, I'm pretty sure, for example, that the policy that I just bought down at Walgreens for $9.95 with the million dollar deductible uh, it's probably not going to qualify. And that's 
exactly correct. It, it would not qualify. Uh, in fact, the law goes to some length to specify what is and what is not health insurance. I mean, it, it can't have deductibles of over a certain level. It can't have co-payments that uh, uh, apply to certain preventive services. It can't have lifetime caps or annual caps in terms of the benefits that it pays out. Uh, and then it has specific benefits it must cover. For example, all health insurance is going to have to cover mental health at, at parity, at the same rate and same terms that it does for physical illnesses. It's going to have to cover drug and alcohol rehabilitation therapy. It'll have to cover prescription drugs uh, going forward. It'll have to cover for children. It has to cover dental and vision care. Uh, it must be one of the most it must cover uh, education services for children uh, with autism, for example. Uh, uh, very expensive, but uh, but also popular provision. Uh, it must cover. Uh, and this is perhaps one of the most controversial aspects. You've seen all this in court cases and all sorts of stuff about this. It must cover contraceptives, uh, including certain abortifacients. So it must be covered in all all insurance plans uh, from now on. Uh, so that if you don't have insurance, that does that meets these specific requirements, your insurance is not compliant with the individual mandate. Now, what does that mean for you if you have insurance today that you're perfectly happy with, but it's not compliant? Well. They, uh, you know, the administration came out and they were very excited. They said, we got the cost of this law down to $950 billion over 10 years. Now, it just shows you how long I've been in Washington. I actually remember when $950 billion was a lot of money. <coughs> now I know it's a rounding error in the latest bailout. But, you know, they said they got down to $950 billion. The only problem was that that sort of left out a few costs. For example, there's $115 billion over 10 years in implementation costs for the law. And for example, the administration is in their budget this year. Uh, they, they propose that they need to hire 3,500 new IRS agents in order to enforce the individual mandate. And those IRS agents have to have their salaries paid and have office staff and all of these sorts of things. Those costs of hiring those folks is an implementation cost, or the regulators that are going to have to go out there. How are they going to set up these ex exchanges at the federal level? How are they going to ensure that insurance companies do what they're supposed to do? All the, 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 the regulators and all that. All those costs are implementation costs. In Washington speak, and they kind of don't know what I'm talking about here, they're called authorized but not appropriated funds. Uh, which means that we're going to spend them, but we don't have to count them. And so those monies will be spent someday, but they're not in the immediate appropriation. So that, uh, so that they don't have to count. So you have that $115 million. Then there's a little bit of double counting that went on in, in this. Uh, for example, uh, the administrator, there, there's a part of this, there's $716 billion in reductions to, uh, to Medicare, Medicare spending. Now, this is the big thing you had to find. We remember the administration, the Romney and, and Ryan came out and they talked about the $716 billion in cuts that the administration was going to make, and the administration said, no, we're not cutting anything from Medicare. Now, you know, I look at the fact that Medicare, uh, by the administration's estimates, is $42 trillion in the red going forward, and I said, my God, I hope somebody's cutting. Uh, but the reality is that there are a number of reductions in Medicare spending, and there's reductions in reimbursements, there's reductions in... Uh, uh, payments to insurance companies through the Medicare Advantage program, there's some other changes in there that would reduce Medicare spending over 10 years by $716 billion. Now, what the administration did was they took the $716 billion and they put it back into the, the, the Medicare Trust Fund. And that's why the Medicare Trust, they say, well, we extend the life of the Medicare Trust Fund by eight years, which, which they did. Then they took the money out of the Medicare Trust Fund and they spent it on subsidies to the law. Only in Washington can you spend the same dollar for two different things and count it both times? <laughs> this is an ongoing problem. This is not unique, by the way, to this law or to anything they went down. We've been doing this for years with the Social Security Trust Fund, the Medicare Trust Fund, and we spend the money twice and we count it both times. But, you know, it does add that up. There's also is some Social Security double counting. There's some Social Security taxes in here where they get the extra tax money, they use it to subsidies, and then they have to pay additional Social Security benefits in the future. But don't worry about that cost. That's down the road. Uh, there's a lot of that sort of double counting in that. <coughs> And then, of course, there's something which you've all heard about, and I'm sure the, the physician folks in the audience have all heard about, the doc fix. We've all done it with the doc fix. <laughs> this, is, this is a thing where 
that said that Medicare spending was going to be cut across the board by 23%. Now, in fairness, I have to say, this was actually, this was existing law at the time the health care bill passed that said that this Medicare cut, this 23% Medicare cut was going to come forward, go forward. It had been the law since, I believe, 2001. Now, every year, looking at this, Congress looks at this cut and says, well, look, we're not suicidal, we're not going to cut Medicare by that much, and they postpone it. Every year, they would postpone those cuts. And then the next year, the cuts would come up and they'd postpone them again and so on. Well, in order to get that cost down to the $950 billion, they just assumed that that year, it would actually occur. $315 billion in cuts over 10 years, they'd actually... <laughs> Uh, thank you, Michael, for the, the pretty exhaustive work. On, and you're right, that was the Reader's Digest version of that. And that that's tough to get our heads around. Uh, please do take a break if you need to. We're going to bring our next uh, panelist up here. Uh, he is the state director of AARP in North Carolina that serves about 1.1 million people in the old North State. He has led advocacy efforts to strengthen Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Uh, he joined AARP a couple of years ago. He commanded the Air Force's largest logistics squadron which included about 750 people over in Okinawa, Japan. Uh, he was also Director of Strategic Development for the U.S. Air Force in Japan, was the Defense Policy Advisor to the U.S. Ambassador to NATO, was the Country Director for the Deputy Undersecretary of the Air Force, and held several political and logistic positions, uh, positions in Europe, for the Air Force, in the United Nations. He, uh, as I said, the last couple of years has lived in North Carolina Director uh, Director Director <coughs> AERP. Uh, please welcome to the dais here Doug Dickerson. Doug, come on up. Doug's going to speak to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. this morning. You know, this is a very controversial law, uh, and any time that there is controversy, it must mean that there must have been a pretty big problem. Uh, so let me just, just say that the congressman's leadership in this community, I believe he's the only member of North Carolina's delegation that has brought together uh, a forum like this to talk about, you know, the, uh, the good and the bad of, of controversy and then what the results are. So the law is the law, and as we look in at the, the effects as this is going to be implemented, I wanted to take you through some of the areas uh, of the reforms and how it will actually make some improvements and extends Medicare's uh, solvency. I also want to say uh, thank you to Mr. Tanner, uh, Mike may have, uh, wherever uh, he went to, because AARP and the, and the Cato Institute, you know, we've had strong positions for and against this legislation in the past, but today's presentations rise above the old debates. Uh, and share the real takeaways of the law and the effect on the lives. So let me move into the, the next phase of this discussion. First, some background. Before I, I speak about the law, it's important to touch on some key issues that led to this major, uh, this major part of the legislation. So I, I wanted to ask you, what do you see? You know, if you're familiar with the famous children's book, uh, The Little Prince, Children's book, adult book uh, by the uh, Antoine Saint uh, uh, de Saint Exupéry. He drew this picture when he was a young boy, and when he drew the picture, you know, I think some some faces in the crowd said, "Yeah, I've seen that picture before." And when the young boy took this picture around to a lot of grown-ups and said, "What do you see? What do you see?" And the people said, "Well, that's a hat." And everybody said, "That's a hat." And the little boy was really frustrated. He says, well, "It's not. It's not a hat. That's." That's a, an elephant that's been eaten by a snake. <laughs> so, you know, I wanted to take a, another look at that and say, you know, I think what it really is, is that it's a chart of the health care needs by a generation of baby boomers. So, take, a, take advantage of the fact that, you know, in this 21st century right now, we have 10,000 people a day who are moving moving into retirement. And that means our health care delivery system has to provide for it. 25% of our 9.6 million person North Carolina population, 25% of them ages 47 to 65. 
that's a huge part of our North Carolina population that's going to be having demands on the healthcare system. And obviously, as a person you know uh, grows older, the demands on uh, on that system rise. So when demand goes up, supply stays stable. What happens? Prices rise. This chart shows how the baby boomers are actually entering the 65 plus phase of life, a time that typically costs more for a person to keep healthy. You should be aware that people over uh, age 50, at least half of them, at least half of them have a chronic condition that requires treatment, such as hypertension. So that begs the question, and I'll tell you, I've, I've taken um, these next few slides, they're not AARP slides, they're from a, a professor over at Duke, a health economist, uh, who's also used to work at OMB, and he's a, uh, he runs um, a leading health consultancy firm in Washington called Avalier Health, uh, Professor Dan Mendelson. So I, I thank Dan for pointing out the same thing that the Medicare trustees uh, informed, was that they warned for years that overpayment to the Medicare Advantage plan was going to be one of the major cost drivers that would push Medicare into insolvency, the Medicare Part A into insolvency, you know, by 2017, 2017, so just four years from now. So in 2010, what happened when Congress passed the Affordable Care Act and its reforms of the business models that are used in the healthcare delivery, you know, the workers, and let me just back up and say the workers and the employers actually, they're the ones that pay into the hospital insurance trust fund. And that's what pays, you know, this, for the services that are in medical uh, Medicare Part A. But those business models needed to be reformed. Otherwise, we're headed for insolvency in 2017. And if you're like me, um, you know, not yet uh, at Medicare eligible, but my parents are, and, and my dad right now is going through prostate cancer treatment, and I know how costly that is. And I know that his four kids, you know, we'd all be bankrupt if we had to pay. <clears throat> have to pay for his services. So what the ACA did is it actually put an insolvent, put that insolvency farther out, you know, for another <coughs> seven years. Mike Tanner said eight years, I'll take the eight. Yeah. So look on, on this slide, what are the causes for the growth in the health care costs? Well, it appears that a larger population, you know, requiring health care is a key reason that uh, the health care costs are growing. It's not the only reason. According to a study from PricewaterhouseCoopers, Cost growth was averaging between 6 and 7 percent the year before the ACA, while higher utilization was an additional 1.7 percent, and price increases above inflation were 1.6 percent. So since the ACA, the cost growth has dropped to 4.5 percent. If you want to, you can say thank you to the ACA for lowering the cost growth for 2 percent, or you can take an explanation that maybe there's some, something else that stimulated that reduction. I think the, uh, the health care um, economists are going to have to figure out what was the real reason for that drop for the, the last few years, last two years. So the financial burden. For those of you that are in the HR field, you know how much your company pays for health care for your employees. But how much do, how much do your employees pay in out of pocket? The left chart over on the left side shows that in that three year period from 2009 in 2011, the employee picked up a 4% larger share of the load. So employers may have seen their costs grow, but they grew at a smaller pace than the employer had to cover. Another key data point is the shift.